What did you learn about the healthcare system from the perspective of a patient? There's a, it's a really interesting question. Where I learned the most about it, frankly, is on, ret on retirement. Uh, there's a plus about being a doctor. There are many pluses, but one of the big pluses is the medical system, how it works is I think for anybody on the outside, it's Byzantine. It's, it's almost impossible to figure out sometimes. Just the insurance was an incredible uh, journey for us. It, it, it's amazing when you're in it. I know the doctors who I trust the most. I know the what I would call the long ball hitters. So any problem that I might have, I know exactly who to go to or somebody I know tells me exactly who to go to and when we retired and we moved out of the city I was practicing in, and we're down in North Carolina in the mountains now, which is quite nice. But all of a sudden, I feel totally naked. I have no idea who to go to. And if I were to go into the, the main hospital around here, I would have no idea which doctors. I would, would just play the roulette and hope for the best, uh, which doctors are going to come see me and all that sort of things. It's all in your head. You don't look sick. Your tests are normal. It's probably anxiety. There's nothing wrong with you. Have you heard these words from physicians, family, and friends? If you're someone who has been struggling and swirling through the revolving door of healthcare to find answers about your health, or if you know someone who is going through this experience, then this podcast is for you. Welcome to the Desperate for a Diagnosis podcast with Laura Nozika a show dedicated to exploring the challenges of living with undiagnosed or rare medical conditions. This podcast explores both sides of the bedside. We will be speaking with patients who have had challenges with finding a diagnosis, along with experts in the field. I'm your host, Laura Nozika. Please note I am not a medical professional, nor am I affiliated with any healthcare, pharmaceutical, or device company. I am an entrepreneur, and I am an independent market researcher focused on helping healthcare organizations better understand the patient perspective. The podcast is not meant to offer medical advice, but to merely share the stories and perspectives of podcast guests. Hello, and welcome to the Desperate for a Diagnosis podcast. I'm your host, Laura Nozika, and I am thrilled beyond thrilled to be talking to our guest today, Dr. Gary Simmons. He is one of the first physicians that I am interviewing for the podcast, and I have a whole boatload of questions for him today, and he'll have a lot of interesting answers, I have a feeling, but let me tell you a little bit about Dr. Simmons, and he has said that I can call him Gary and prefers that I call him Gary for our conversation today. Gary is a highly experienced neurosurgeon, former head of an academic neurosurgery program at Virginia Tech Carillion Clinic. He is a professor and teaches regularly at the Virginia Tech School of Neuroscience and Virginia Tech Carillion School of Medicine. He was a biochemistry major at Dartmouth. He went to medical school at Rutgers and neurosurgery residency and medical research fellowship at Walter Reed. He also holds a master's degree in healthcare delivery science from Dartmouth. And with all of that non-busy stuff, because it sounds like you have so many dull and boring moments there, Gary, he also went ahead and wrote a book. He's written a few books, some fiction, some nonfiction, but his most recent book is a fictional account of a character who is also a neurosurgeon, but also has some run-ins with the other side, let's just say, and it's called Death Pale Flag, and we'll talk about that. But first, Gary, thank you so much for joining me today. I, again, so excited to be talking with you. Oh, it is absolutely my honor. I'm delighted. Thank you, Laura. Yeah. Yeah. We were having a little pre-interview chit-chat, lots of pre-interview chit-chat that I certainly don't want to miss out on. But tell me about a little bit about what you're doing now. Are you still practicing or are you just full-time author and going on 
exciting book tours? What, what have you been doing? <laughs> Not a lot of exciting book tours, but I've had some excitement. No, I, I stopped operating a few years ago. I actually, I had a mystery uh, illness for a while, many years ago, probably about 30 years ago, that eventually did uh, get a diagnosis, but I was pretty wiped out by it neurologically and came back and went back into work and all that sort of stuff. But there was always a little bit of neurological residua and it started getting worse. I'd start getting some double vision during surgery. And I said, nah, it's probably time to pull the ripcord if I can't be up hundred percent. So I did, I stepped out of several years earlier than I had planned to. And so I went into a lot of teaching at undergrad and med school and, and writing and I don't know, a bunch of other stuff that seems to have, have made life pretty busy. Yeah, it doesn't take much. I know people who will say, oh my gosh, I don't want to be bored in retirement or if I quit my job today, I'd be so bored. What would I do? I don't know how you could be bored. There's always something to do and learn. But that's interesting. I, I did not know that you were on the other side of the bedside, let's just say, as a patient. And they always say doctors make the worst patients. If you had to evaluate yourself as a patient, Gary, how would you describe yourself? I, I, would, I would give that uh, grading scale to my wife, who, who did a lot of my care uh, during that time. But uh, I would say probably insufferable and uh, very impatient to get back to work. As a matter of fact, I tried to get back to work too early, had a relapse. It, it went on and on. It was a long protracted uh, thing, but I was lucky enough that it was what we in the, the business would call self-limited, meaning it, it's supposed to get better. And for the most part it did, but mm -hmm. like I said, it left, it left some problems, which I figured as I got older would get worse. And I, I'm correct on that. So I also didn't want to, there's a lot of neurosurgeons who hold on to the knife into their seventies and at the last moment, drop the knife and collapse into a wheelchair. And I didn't want to do that to my wife, seeing I neglected her for several decades mm -hmm. leading up to that. What did you learn about the healthcare system from the perspective of a patient? There's a, it's a really interesting question where I learned the most about it, frankly, is on retirement. One of the things about, there's a plus about being a doctor. There are many pluses, but one of the big pluses is the medical system, how it works, it is I think for anybody on the outside, it's Byzantine. It's, it's almost impossible to figure out sometimes. Just the insurance was an incredible uh, journey for us. It, it, it's amazing when you're in it, I know the doctors who I trust the most. I know the what I would call the long ball hitters. So any problem that I might have, I know exactly who to go to or somebody I know tells me exactly who to go to. And when we retired, we moved out of the city I was practicing in and we're down in North Carolina in the mountains now, which is quite nice. But all of a sudden I feel totally naked. I have no idea who to go to. And if I were to go into the, the main hospital around here, I would have no idea which doctors. I would just play the roulette and hope for the best, uh, which doctors are going to come see me and all that sort of thing. So it's it, it, there's an interesting dynamic. All of a sudden, reality is shoved in your face of, of what everybody else has to face. How do you think that experience being a patient as a physician and how you approach patient care? Yeah, I think it it certainly made me respect much more what the patients are going through. The irony was not lost on me that I that I sustained a really significant neurological problem, which is what all my patients have to go through and their families. That and I think if anything, it really I always had, frankly, the utmost respect. For the patients, they just always seem so brave. And I, I use the word grace. They just always seem to be so full of grace. But where it, re where it really opened my eyes is, I think, what these illnesses do to the family and how terrifying it is for the family and disruptive it is for the family. And it really made me focus more on what the families are going through. I, I, I 
when I teach the students now, I tell them that the patient is a patient, obviously, but you have more than one patient. You have all the loved ones of that mm -hmm. patient who you better be spending time with and explaining things to and tending to their pain and emotional distress while you're tending to the patient or you're not doing your job. That's so important that you bring that to medical students. And I have no idea what it's like to be in medical school other than watching practically every medical TV show out there. <laughs> it's like Grey's Anatomy is my only point of reference of what it's like to be an intern, a resident, and what all that means. But that's, that, that is part of it. And I actually interviewed a lady who was a, um, I don't know, the terms kind of change these days, care giver, care support person, kind of the nomenclature's changing, care partner, things like this. But she was a spouse and her husband had MS and she took care of him for 10 years. And she wrote a book also about her journey. And it's just, and it was, it's very important for me to bring out that aspect in this podcast because it isn't just about the patient and we're all patients at, at some point in time, regardless of how acute, how severe our, what our, whatever our thing is that we have, but it is, it's a lot of burden on a caregiver because everybody has their own degree of worry and questions and they want reassurance that you'll be okay. And it's just, it's, it stems beyond, like you said, just you as the patient. So I think that's wonderful that you're really making sure that medical students understand that because them being so young, their encounter with the health system personally is probably pretty low. They probably haven't really had much engagement with the system from a patient standpoint. No, I no, absolutely. Yeah. And our, I, you know, one of the things about neurosurgery is that you're on the extreme end of a lot of these diseases that the, the patients themselves are often not going to do well. And so again, I, you, you, I think it's our duty to, to care for the families and the families in these circumstances, particularly when it's acute, when something has happened in a very short time span, like a bad car accident or uh, mm -hmm. a brain tumor or something. They, there's so much guilt. It seemed to be one of my greatest targets was the guilt of the family. It, and they get put into positions where it, it just feels like guilt is the only answer. So they, somebody who's in coma and has a terribly injured brain and everybody's coming to them saying, should we disconnect? Should we stop support? Can we take the organs? And mm -hmm. it just feels mm -hmm. like whatever they decide, they're going to feel bad about. They're going to feel terrible guilt. And they're already feeling like I should have taken the keys away. I should have told them not to go on that trip. I should have. And, and so I really would try to spend as much time as I could trying to settle that whole guilt picture down and explain that some situations you just can't make into a good situation. You didn't mm -hmm. cause it. This is just the cosmic spin of the roulette wheel, if you will. And, and what we have to deal with it is the reality. Well, yeah, there's tremendous suffering in the family in those circumstances. And did you subspecialize at all or broad neurosurgery that you practice? Yeah, I back when I trained, there wasn't much subspecialization anyway, but I did a heavy load of pediatrics. So I did both peds okay. and adults. And then just by the nature of where I practice a lot of trauma, because I was always at level one trauma centers. In our pre-chat, I had mentioned that uh, I have acquaintances with a few surgeons, given my background in, in the hospital systems, and you get to know the personalities of different specialties. They might be very stereotypical, but patients like to talk about the God complex, the God complex of physicians. And I've heard that with neurosurgeons, that's pretty high up there as far as the God complex goes. What do you think about that? Is that something that agree, disagree? What's your take on that, Gary? Yeah, there was a movie, I can't remember the name of it now, that was at, I don't know, 80s, 90s, where uh, a surgeon was challenged with that. And he said, in this hospital, I am God. 
<laughs> yeah, and I think I even address this in the uh, novel that, that to one degree, to a certain degree, I, I guess you have to have a certain level of ego to allow yourself to to cut open somebody and start tinkering around inside. Mm -hmm. If you don't, I would be worried if somebody was scared of their own shadow or whatever. I'm not sure I would want them operating on me. But I was saying that in neurosurgery, at least, I think the egos take a tremendous beating. We're still at a stage, at least in our level of technology and ability with the organ system, that the outcomes are terrible. That's our way of saying a lot of people die or are left with terrible, terrible deficits. You, you are used to terrible things, terrible outcomes for one patient after another, on top of the fact, or on top of that, we contribute to some of those outcomes. It's not, it's not like Grey's Anatomy, maybe, I don't know, because I, I don't actually watch <laughs> it, but it, it's not like where you, your knife slips and you go, whoops, I just cut out third grade or something. But you are always saying to yourself, I could have done this better. I could have done that better. I should have thought of this. I should have thought of that. And there are times that you did not do the very best job just because all of us are human and aren't going to aren't going to hit a home run every time. And so you not only have that background of very bad outcomes, you have the fact that you sometimes contribute to those bad outcomes and you take a tremendous ego beating. That's a lot of lost sleep at night. Mm -hmm, you would close mm -hmm. your eyes and you would see the operative field. You would see things happening. And so, yeah, I, I am sure that there, there are egos there, but I do believe they take a beating. And then I think what happens is a lot of physicians are called upon to multitask and make a lot of decisions quickly and a lot of them. And so it comes across sometimes as almost like a complex because you're being called to make these decisions fast and mm -hmm. furious. So somebody tells you something and, and you say, okay, do this. And then PA comes up and tells you about somebody else and you're like, okay, do this. Then the resident comes up and tells you, and it just, it just feels that way. And it, it's funny because you get home. It's not funny for the family, but you get home and your spouse or partner or, or child says, oh, today this happened at work or this happened at school. And all of a sudden you're barking a solution to them where they have no desire for a solution whatsoever <laughs> that uh, all they want you to do is hear them. And, and you're like, no, you did this and that'll solve that problem. So it's hard to step out of that persona. And I think that does give a little bit of that sense of a God complex. And I think there's a, a, a lot of just the population at large that sees, oh, he's a doctor. Oh, he's a surgeon. But I don't know that people really have a good sense for maybe it's not, it's wonderful, but maybe it's not all cracked up to be what people think it is, like taking a toll on a family or personal life or cutting into other things you wanted to do or plan to do and you were on call and you had to leave the birthday party or, or whatever it, it might be. What's your perspective from that standpoint? Yeah, 100%. I agree. It, and this is going to vary from specialty to specialty, but it's certainly our call was very intrusive. The and particularly again, if you're working at a trauma center, because it, it just feels like all the bad stuff never happens when the uh, banker's hours, if you will. Mm -hmm. In fact, it happens in the middle of the night. I even studied that, and something like 70% of our emergency consultations came in between midnight and six or something on sure. that order. So you, you are getting called in a lot. The bizarre phenomena at least in, again, in my specialty was you would get beat up all night with all these calls and all these interruptions. You, you never got much sleep. And then you just rolled into another day of work. You, as a matter of fact, you would go in and do brain surgery the next morning, which huh. is crazy if you think about it, but it's kind of how we were trained and everything was oriented to just being able to work when you were exhausted. But that's not a healthy thing for anybody. And mm -hmm. hopefully it's something we'll figure out and, and improve upon. But you're also right. My family and I would never really do anything that was involved at all or super fun uh, while on call because it was just 
invariable, you would get called in. Yeah. And as I mentioned, I, I do market research for a living and I do interview doctors almost weekly. And again, having worked in the healthcare systems in Chicago as well, I've gotten to know physicians. And I do like to bring to light that doctors are people too. They deal with things that everybody else does because they feel like they're that doctors are put on a pedestal and yet people, patients get very frustrated with doctors for a variety of different reasons, which we'll talk about a little bit. So I do like to bring out the fact that there is a human side to 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 medicine. But Gary, I want to I want to ask you about a few things, but I want to run by you some of the things that I do hear from excuse me, the patients that I do interview for research or the ones that I've talked with on the podcast who have had scenarios and experiences like yourself personally trying to get a diagnosis. And some say they have seen 20 physicians, 50 physicians over the course of many years, and all the tests have been done. And my trailer even calls out to some of these ideas and, and comments and verbatims of, you don't look sick. It's all in your head. It must be anxiety. Your tests are inconclusive. You look normal. All of these things. And then to top it off with, I hear quite frequently is that the doctor was very dismissive of my symptoms. I had one podcast guest who had been having a lot of issues with muscle fatigue and joint pain and just generalized fatigue after a, a car accident and a brain injury, actually. And again, her brain looked good. All of the tests looked good. And she kept going and kept going to different physicians. And she was starting to see a, a new doctor. I don't recall the specialty, but she said, I had to make sure that I looked nice because I thought if I looked nice, and presented myself that this doctor would like me. And I felt I had to make sure the doctor liked me in order for him to want to treat me and help me and dig beyond, here's a pill or I have nothing for you. So when you hear things like that, what do you think about? What comes to mind for you? My goodness, you, you, uh, you've opened up a whole bunch of cans of worms, <laughs> not just one. <laughs> The, so I have a lot of thoughts about it. I fully get it. I fully commiserate, fully understand. And I think I, I'll try to give you a generalized answer and then maybe a few specifics. But I think first and foremost to understand is indeed these are just human beings trying to do uh, what they can do in their jobs. It, a lot of people do see it as a calling, which is good. It's good to have that extra motivation, but not everybody has that. Other forces come on to play on these, I counsel or advise pre-med students, and they all seem so, they all seem so idealistic, but mm -hmm. we, we love to beat that out of them. Just getting into medical school anymore has become, I don't know, a, a, a slog of biblical proportions where I, I hand it to, everybody tells me, everybody my age is like, Oh, Generation Z, they're lazy. They don't do things. But I'm looking at them and going, oh, you, you should see the pre-meds. You should see what they're trying to do mm. just to get into school, which I think is very dehumanizing to begin with. And I think medical school tends to select out a certain type of person. They tend to be a little bit more concrete thinking because they have to memorize a lot. There's not as much critical thinking, adaptive thinking that... I think it also selects for people who are comfortable going it alone, sitting in a sitting in a library for hour upon hour, studying this and studying that. It, while medicine itself anymore is being practiced much more as a team type of sport, mm -hmm. and yet we, I think, our selection process and then what we do to people, it, it just may be pushing a certain personality type onto the students. And then once they get there, it's busy. Medicine is just busy. You're always multitasking. You're always running around. Maybe for some of the reasons are very much altruistic, but you also see that the harder you work, the more you make. And so that gets involved in the equation as well. So that there's a real milieu going into each 
physician exchange, each physician interface. And as I said before, you get a kind of a roulette wheel if you don't know the system and you don't know the people. So you may get a marvelous person, the salt of the earth, or you may get somebody who's, who's just not really in it for you anymore. I will say, you know, I, I told you I've written a bunch of books on burnout. I wrote them with a good friend of mine who's a world expert on the subject, a clinical psychologist. And his contention is, I've asked him specifically because he's treated thousands of physicians. And his contention is there's only about seven to eight percent of physicians who are bad seeds. And he said, if you're seeing bad behavior from your physician, a lot of times it probably is burned out. They're burned out. They are just showing all the signs of wear and tear. But it doesn't change the fact of what the patient's experience is can be far from ideal. Um, first of all, the time given for each appointment is short. It's gotten shorter, particularly as more physicians work for these big mega systems, got mm. shorter with uh -huh. all the computerization as well. And so they're always in a hurry. They're always late. At least I remember always being <laughs> late. And then you're right. Then it doesn't take much, I think, for certain physicians, at least, to be set off. I, I have a lecture about that I give at the medical schools in various places about do are there undesirables, I call it, are there patients who are undesirable? And do we make judgments about patients by their appearance, by their what work they do, by how they inter interact with you? And if we do, what, what does that actually impact upon their care? And I would argue that it does. That, mm -hmm. uh, so something like, would you call it patient profiling? Is that what, what you would yeah, refer to? Yeah. You know, and then there's, but there are interesting twists to that, for example. So one of the examples I give is I, I would forever be coming down to the trauma bay and somebody would, one of the team would, there's always 30 people around the, the patient and somebody would give you the history and they would say, this 38 year old man was driving and got into this terrible accident, was thrown through the windshield, has this, that, this, that, a thousand different horrible injuries. And they would always put a tag on the end, but he was drunk. And it, it was almost as if, okay, something absolutely horrible happened to this patient, but it makes sense in the cosmos because the guy was drunk. Mm -hmm. And in this talk I give, I, I talk about the fact that one day, way back when I was in college, I went out to visit a friend with a bunch of other friends. And long story short, I ended up driving home drunk. No, nothing untoward happened, but, but there for the grace of God, when I, it could have easily been me and three other people dead in the car or whatever. And that we, I do think we are in danger of making these judgments about patients. I think sometimes like in cases like that, it's maybe even to alleviate our own anxiety about, bad things happening to people. Well, this isn't going to happen to me or my family because they don't drive drunk or they don't take IV injectable drugs or they don't do this or they don't do that. But you can play that game forever. And the reality is bad things happen to people, period. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, I, I agree with you. We, we don't want to be profiling the patients. We should be doing everything we can for each and every patient. And I, what I found through the years was if you give patient even a modicum of respect, treat them with respect, address them as sir or ma'am, try to answer their questions, give them a few minutes of eye contact and show some kindness and concern. It doesn't matter what their background is. They, you know, uh, it doesn't matter what their level of education is or the anything, any of these things that, that people are putting into their profiling computer, if you will, they warm to you. They're grateful. They are cooperative, you know, in their, their care. So I think it's a huge lesson. I think that's really a, a very sharp point that you made with the patient feeling like they have to dress up to mm -hmm. have the doctor like them. The doctor should like them, period.
no matter what. Does that does that surprise you that that someone would feel that they need would need to go to that extent to get care? It does not surprise me. It makes me sad, though. It makes me, again, want to reinforce the message that, look, guys, we got to do better. We got to do better than this. Do you think the system is set up for that, to do better in that regard? It's always easy to blame a system or the system or whatever. And it has got a lot of reasons for it to blame. They, it is becoming more and more as doctors fold into these various systems that they're working for a business. And this business ultimately has its own priorities. And this is not to paint them as evil because they're the ones that have to interface with the government and the insurance companies and the lawyers and all that sort of thing. And they do, they have to do their part of the job, but it, it, it's just more, more barriers, if you will, to direct impact and you don't see the direct impact of certain behaviors and stuff. Either way, both the administrative down to the caregivers and the caregivers over to the administrators. So yeah, we become hostage to things like these, what they call RVUs, which is how they mm -hmm. rate the amount of work you're doing yep. and, and all that sort of thing. And, and it does end up scrunching the amount of time that patients are given and the, the amount of personal say that the, the patients have and stuff like that. It just becomes more monolithic and difficult for them to navigate. But modern medicine is complex. And again, I, when I hear about these patients who have seen 20 doctors, some of it is that modern medicine is complex. You, they, it is not going to be one doc who knows it all. And so you end up having to go see several specialists and we're probably over-specialized, but the flip side is you have the legal system biting at the physician's heels and coming up with answers all the time. And sometimes the answers just aren't going to come. I think mm -hmm. part of what one of your uh, points was so much, I think, could be gained by physicians feeling comfortable enough to just say, I don't know. I don't know what's going on right now, but here's what I'm going to try to do to figure out. Rather than some of the other things that you were saying, you're just going to have to live with it. Oh, you're just, it's yeah. all in your head. Oh, you're anxious. Here's some anti-anxiety medicines. I yeah. agree. With, I, but I think if you were able to just say, I, I, it's certainly the tack I tried. It, it seemed to be reasonable. When I didn't know, I said, I really don't know, but we're going to chip away at it. Sometimes we have to trial and error. This happened a lot with back pain, for example, is mm -hmm. one of the things we dealt with a lot in neurosurgery is back pain. And you don't know what's causing it. Three quarters of the time, it felt like we certainly knew that nine tens didn't need surgery, but that didn't mean it wasn't real. It meant that surgery yeah. was only going to make it worse. What we would do is say, here are the things that we know it isn't, and here are the things that we know are not appropriate. Now we're going to have to try things, and we're going to have to try other specialists, and whatever works is what we're going to go with. So the reality in medicine is a lot of times we don't know, absolutely, and we need to be upfront and very honest about it and never dismissive about the patient. And and not to say that some of those things that I had mentioned that physicians actually verbalized to a patient, but it was a patient's takeaway that that's that they that's the vibe that they got that they got from the physician that oh this doctor must think I'm nuts. The doctor saw that I saw all these other specialists, so now he thinks I'm a frequent flyer and probably thinks I I really am crazy, but I'm in pain and pain is subjective, of course. And uh, in fact, I had one podcast guest say that she was upset that a physician wrote something on her chart to, to some degree of, oh, she probably has some kind of mental health issue and, and whatnot. And, and she just knew that if she went to another physician and, and sent the chart notes over to this other doc, that physician would see that and right away make a decision before that physician even saw my guest that 
okay, I know what I'm dealing with. I don't know. Do physicians make these presuppositions of patients before they even really get into it and get into the facts? It certainly can happen. Absolutely. I think, and again, there's all sorts of permutations to this, but what I tried, what I always tried to teach the, the residents and the med students was in the ideal world, you don't go in with any presuppositions of any kind, meaning not just what we're talking about, but even diagnostically, it's best not to look at the x-rays beforehand, if you will. It's best not to spend a lot of time reading the chart. I prefer to go in, hear it from the patient themselves, do the exam, then look at the the data, the supporting Mm -hmm. data so that you don't build a story in your head before you've actually heard it and before you've actually seen it. But the problem is the time is ticking away. This The electronic medical record needs feeding. And so you begin to start feeling, I have to shortcut here. I have to shortcut there. And you you can end up, okay, it's much quicker if I get all the, the data in first. And then I it's what it takes less time pulling it out of the patient and that sort of thing. Or if I look at the MRI first, I pretty much know what's going on uh, and then I can foreshorten our discussion and stuff like that. So it, there are different factors impacting it. But ideally, you would want to take each patient, each case from its very roots and work your way up and through and get a good exam and then look at your data. And It is interesting because we've had discussions, for example, what do you do when a patient says, do you mind if I record this visit? Mm. And it's amazing how many docs say, oh, absolutely not. Absolutely. I I don't want that at all. It could be used against me in a court of law. And I'm like, what do you think is going to be used against you? What is it about the visit that you're doing that could make you culpable in some sort of legal problem? And so I... I don't know. I I think we've allowed ourselves sometimes to feel like we're in an adversarial situation. Rather, we're we're both on the same side. Yeah, take I'm like take the recording home and play it for, for your family. Listen to it more than once, because we know that the patients often only process a few points, mm-hmm. particularly mm-hmm. if they're in pain or they're distressed or they're anxious or they're and, and if you're telling somebody they have a brain tumor, they're the first time around, they're only going to process one or two sentences in a I have a brain hour. tumor. That's all they're hearing. Right. I have a brain tumor. Yep. Mm-hmm. But yeah. It's complex human inter- interactions under some of the most fraught circumstances. But the more we mechanize it, the more we've made it into a, a factory process, the harder it is going to be for both sides, both for the patient, but also for the physicians to be real physicians, real doctors. Mm-hmm. It's interesting that you mentioned low back pain in the context of neurosurgery. And I've done some market research around chronic low back pain as well. And what I'm curious about is, so we talk about the brain as a structure and its parts and it has a function, but I'm wondering if you think that there's a difference between the brain and the mind and how the mind controls things like pain or not, or controls progression of disease or not, because I'm sure you've heard or seen plenty of things about spontaneous remission of cancers, or I, I thought about things a different way or changed my mindset. And now my chronic pain isn't as bad anymore. And I know that, that there's a lot of talk just with low back pain. Like you said, you've done everything or you've gone through all the tests or presented all the modalities and and nothing works. But what do you, do you see a difference between the brain and and the mind? We could get very metaphysical there. I, maybe I'll stay physiologically, physiological, at least at first. The, and there's a couple streams here, but so in one stream, I think it's very interesting. One of the things, one of the things I, I used to tell patients is the classic slip disc with a pinched nerve in the back, it causes a pain that screams down the leg. And it can be some of the worst pain that's out there. So we call that a radiculopathy. But I used to tell patients, it's interesting 
because where the inflammation is, where the problem is in your, the middle of your back, where you're feeling the pain is in the butt, down the leg, in the foot, numbness, tingling, all this. And what I would explain to them is your brain is actually getting fooled. The, the brain is used to getting signals from that nerve about what's going on in your leg, but there's nothing wrong with the leg right now. The pain is mm -hmm. due to these, these signals going to your brain and your brain is getting fooled. Not that saying it's all in your mind, just recognizing that the brain has tremendous control over all this. And all pain is in your brain, if you will. It's all in your mind, if you will, because your brain doesn't, it doesn't, there aren't nerves that give a, a different signal for pain as they do for light touch, if you will. It's all just whether one neuron fires or doesn't all the way up the chain to the various regions of your brain. But your brain interprets different things and it has created the whole system of pain really for your survival so when you're stepping on sharp things so that when the house is on fire, so that, that when you, you're, something's wrong with your liver or whatever, your pain is there for survival benefit, but obviously it, it can cause us a lot of, of misery. And so it's just how the brain interprets these various signals. If somehow you could figure out how to retrain your brain, you potentially you wouldn't even feel the pain. We do that, that we can put these stimulators in the spine, for example, that will block pain signals. It doesn't block pain signals. It actually competes with the pain signals up to the brain. But again, it's fooling the brain, just like when you rub your knee, when you've torn a ligament in your knee and you rub it and it feels better. It doesn't actually, the, the problem is still there doesn't solve mm -hmm. any problem, but you're rechanneling the signals that are going to your brain. Anyway, that's one side of the equation. The other side, I think, which is really fascinating, it, you were asking, the reality is the brain controls everything. Everything that's going on in the rest of our body is dictated by the brain. How fast is our heart going to beat? How all the signals that are going to our bowels, when we're when somebody's threatening our life and we go to sympathetic overdrive, we shut down large sections of our body so that we can go into fight or flight. When we're relaxed, it shifts blood supply and things over to other maintenance type functions of the body, like your GI tract and stuff like that. So anyway, the brain is constantly, and then it has all the hormones that go out to various areas out of your pituitary gland. So the brain is constantly monitoring and constantly adjusting what's going on in the brain and that, I mean, going on in the body. And that's going to, that's going to include virtually everything that's going on in the body. So ostensibly, if somehow you could get your brain to step up its immune support, if it, if you could get the brain to ignore various signals, you could change whole physiologies going on in the rest of your body. The short answer to your question after all that babbling is mm -hmm. I absolutely believe that you can alter uh, various responses to disease and disorders using your brain. How good are we at doing that? Not necessarily very good. There are going to be people on the bell, on the far end of the bell, bell shaped curve who beat the normal physiology and supersede it. So yeah, I would firmly believe it's possible. I'm not sure how many people will fall into that category, though. but I'm, I'm sure we do it. All of us do it all the time that we're adjusting our physiology to the way our brain is going. And I, I think we all know that when certain things make us feel good, everything feels easier. And when certain things are dragging us down, everything is more difficult and that sort of thing. Yeah. Had you ever diagnosed any mystery symptoms as a physician? I guess I, you'd have to be more specific for me. Yeah. <laughs> so let's say a patient had a, I don't know, a certain set of symptoms and let's say they had, they went to a cardiologist and then rheumatologist and turns out it was really more of a neuro-related 
issue and maybe they were seeking a diagnosis for a while. Is that something you ever came across and maybe you were the diagnosing physician with the solution? Yeah. Yes, on a couple of levels. Yeah. Every so often you would get that somebody who had bounced around and you get some insight, probably better lucky than good type of thing. And you say, wait a minute, this isn't, this is something else. I actually have a whole section on that of what I call diagnostic red herrings that, and again, medicine is fragmented into these super specialties by necessity because nobody can master it all. It's hard enough to stay up on neurosurgery. In fact, neurosurgery is splitting into subspecialties, which I think is crazy, but, but it, it is hard to stay up on everything. And sometimes it's just out of blind luck. The poor patient has bounced around a lot, finally arrive on your doorstep and you look at them and you say, this is easy. It's easy because it's in my ballywick. It's uh-huh, in my uh-huh. backyard. And you go, oh, you yeah, know, this one was a piece of cake. The other thing that often happens is more in the acute or emergent phase is it's very easy for a team, a, a medical team to go in the wrong direction. And we get into the whole idea of biases that we all have when dealing with cognitive exercises. But it's, it, particularly when there's not a lot of time to think about things, you will seize on one diagnosis maybe. I think it's this. And then you go into all this confirmation bias, anything that kind of supports the diagnosis. Okay, yeah, see, this, this adds to it. And then, but your brain ignores anything that contradicts the diagnosis. So you keep going down this alley of a wrong diagnosis. And, th- and that happens with startling frequency. I, and unfortunately, I think it's human nature, but it's something that we try to work on with the residents and the medical students to remain s- critical thinkers, to remain scientifically skeptical of whatever you're thinking. Because if you don't, you just support it with your confirmation bias. And nowadays, particularly, it's so easy to get a picture inside of the body. You get a CAT scan, you get an MRI, Mm -hmm. and the MRI may show something. And everybody says, oh, look, it's this. And they think they have the answer. So again, they keep going down that alley. Whereas if if you come into it and you look at it and you say, wait a minute, that doesn't add up. That doesn't mesh what's going on, you could end up in a totally different, totally different diagnosis. And like I said, that would happen with startling frequency, particularly when they got the imaging. It's like the imaging has the answer. It's the answer sheet. Uh, But often it is not. It's like I said, it's a red hearing. I'll give you a quick example. Get called to the ER for a person whose leg suddenly goes paralyzed and terribly in pain. And they got an MRI of the spine and it showed what they call severe stenosis. It was very narrow around the nerves. And they said, you need to come down, get this patient up to the operating room. They've gone paralyzed in the leg. And we said, wait a minute. If, If it's severely narrowed around all these nerves, why isn't the other leg involved? And so I, I went down and I saw the patient and I said, I heard your legs not working well. I just happened to put my hand on the leg to start examining it, and it was cold. I was, wait a minute, the leg shouldn't be ice cold. And I felt for pulses, and they were gone. And um, the patient had what's called a femoral artery occlusion. They, they had shut off the main artery to the leg, and uh, this had nothing to do with their spine, but because it showed a finding on the spine. Everybody just assumed that's the mm-hmm. problem. Get the neurosurgeons down, go to spine surgery when what they needed was surgery on a blood vessel. So yeah, they, these things can happen. It's not due to incompetency. It's due to human human error and mm-hmm. kind of the way things are done. So that's what we would really work on. Like I said, is Never be so sure of yourself. Always call into what you're thinking with a lot of doubt, scientific skepticism. What happens if I'm wrong? What happens if it's something else? That sort of thing. 
So Gary, we started having a metaphysical conversation, if you will, which leads me to want to talk about your book, Death's Pale Flag, which I have a copy right here. Again, learning about this medical thriller genre. This is a fiction book that I think is probably a fair accounting of your experience as a neurosurgeon, but the twist is tossing in the paranormal. So tell us about the premise for this book. I'm really fascinated in hearing about this. I thank you for bringing it up, but I wanted to write a book that really gave a good solid peek behind the curtain, if you will, of high-level neurosurgery in the modern era. And I've wanted to do that for years. So I would write down little pieces, little vignettes and stuff like that. And it turned out that every good idea I have for writing books, somebody else comes up with before I actually get there. So a couple <laughs> of really good books have come out doing that through the last decade or so. But they were nonfiction and they felt a little bit didactic to me. And I started thinking that it would be maybe much more immersive, much more productive for the reader if it was fictional in that I, I thought maybe it would feel much more like they were the ones at the head of the table watching blood pour out of a brain or something mm, like mm -hmm. that if I turned it into a story. So I needed, I, I needed some sort of fictional part of it. Actually, I had a whole totally different premise originally, but I, it actually got a little political and it got a little maybe too contemporary. So that one went in the wastebasket. Uh, but I've been raised in a house where one half of the house firmly believed in ghosts and had their ghost experiences. And I started thinking, I, in my career at least, I spent a lot of time in the book, we call it the bridge between life and death. So many of my patients were right on the bridge, either going one direction or the other. We were constantly trying to pull some people back and I were real. If ghosts were a true entity, maybe it's people on that bridge a lot, people who are around the bridge a lot that they might first reach out to or they might be most familiar with. And I thought the surgeon would be maybe a prime target or a prime character for if there are ghosts to interface with. And so I, I, I had him start seeing things, which he originally thought were halluc hallucinations, but be eventually convinced himself that were ghosts. And that allowed me to explore a number of things. One, one is he just losing his mind. He's clearly burning out, but is he losing his mind? Or could the ghost be real? If the ghosts are real, what are they trying to do? What's the purpose of them? And then I also thought it makes a nice dynamic to say what's actually more scary, the supernatural world or the kind of the natural world of what mm -hmm. he's experiencing. The real, the real deal. Yeah. 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 And I thought it'd be fun for the reader to think, yeah, what's actually more scary here? What's giving me more goosebumps? And I just thought it, it was a decent vehicle to be able to really get into that stuff. And I, I think I told you before the show that I'm really interested kind of in the dynamic between science and we can call it spirituality or uh -huh. which would include religion and paranormal or supernatural or, or whatever. And so it allowed me to play a little with that as well. And I love a ghost story. So all those things kind of <laughs> came into it. Yeah. You said that you grew up with ghost stories, right? Yes. Between your mom and your grandmother, I think you said. Exactly. And then, of course, yeah. therefore, I read every ghost book as a kid and scared myself. <laughs> you were very gracious in dedicating your book to your wife, Cindy, right? Yes. And also to the patients and their families who must suffer through the ravages of neurological disease and injury. How lovely that you acknowledged your patient. It's hard to go through all that, through a career in that business, and not have the deepest of respect for all of them. And as we talked about earlier, uh, obviously for the patients who, uh, I, Every day, their bravery and grace just stunned me. I was 
I, I always thought if I were going through anything close to what those guys were going through, I'd be throwing things, breaking windows, screaming at everybody, demanding. Mm -hmm. And I, they, they would be counseling me, it felt like, more than, than vice versa. So, yeah, it's hard to talk about and not get emotional. And as I told you, as I learned through the years, the families just as much. And as you and I were just talking about it, it doesn't matter what their background is, what, you know, what their cultural background is, where they're from. I, it is stunning to see it through virtually everyone. Uh, it really is a testament to humanity and the human spirit that no matter what's happened in their lives up till then, they just show amazing bravery, uh, amazing humanity, amazing grace. Gary, it's been a honor and a privilege to talk with you today and any of your patients and their families, I'm sure had to feel so lucky to have you as their physician because you don't always get the feeling that you get from physicians as I'm hearing from you in terms of how you worked with patients and in, in some of the worst times of their lives to, to try to be coming the calming beacon for them. So they're very lucky to have had you. And I'm certainly lucky to have been able to bring you on my show and hopefully we'll maybe get to do it again sometime. No, I, I am deeply honored to be on it. I, I want to, if I might make one other point about one of the things I was trying to do with the book, which I think is a important message. And that is I think it'll become clear to anybody reading it just how fragile life is. Just we go through our lives. We're so busy every day. We get irritated. We get frustrated. We get political. We get this. We get that. And I think what we fail to realize is just how precious it is, how each minute is truly some sort of miracle. Whether you want to be scientific or spiritual, it is what we experience is 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 miraculous and it can be gone so easily at any moment. And I think it, I, one of my messages would be to cherish it, to cherish the people around you, these family and friends that mm -hmm. can be so devastated if something happens to you. Thank you for allowing me to bring that out. And I think our sensibilities are very much in tune with one another about how important this stuff is. I agree. I agree. Well, they always say, make your mess your message. And a lot of people that I've interviewed for the podcast have done that with books and in different capacities and businesses and coaching businesses, and they all want to give back. And it's so lovely to to see certainly a physician of your caliber, one to be willing to be on my little show here and, and to have contributed so much to the medical community and going forward with teaching. So Gary, thank you for being here. This is another episode of the Desperate for a Diagnosis podcast. I'm your host, Laura Nozika. Don't forget to share, rate, and review, and stay well, everyone. Thanks so much. See you soon. Oh, my goodness. That's a wrap on another compelling story. Thanks for listening to the Desperate for a Diagnosis podcast. If you would like more information about today's guests or to find out more about Laura, me, go to DesperateForADiagnosis.com. If you enjoyed the show, please subscribe, rate, and review the podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube, or wherever you get your podcasts. You can also follow show updates and healthcare news on the podcast's Facebook page. If you would like to be a guest on the show, or if you have any questions, advice, or suggestions for our guests, please email me at lauramarie at DesperateForADiagnosis.com.